All right, good afternoon. They all spread all over the place. Uh, it's going to make it tough on me. All right, uh, I'm Nicolas Graff, uh, teaching at ESSEC for the past, I've been teaching at ESSEC for the past five years. Uh, before that, I was in the United States, uh, the University of Houston. I'm French speaking, so if you have questions in French, uh, then, then feel free to ask in French. Uh, I will then translate and respond in English. Okay? Today, I've been asked to do this master class on something related to strategy. Uh, how many of you are interested into a program called the SMIB program? None. Ah, okay, so to raise your hand. Uh, we have a program here that is uh, specifically designed for, for strategy. It's called the SMIB, uh, which stands for strategy. What is the M? Strategy and Management of International Businesses. Uh, and so I thought I would actually uh, give a lecture that I would give probably in that, in that program that we have. Uh, although we could certainly have the same uh, topic uh, being discussed in other programs that we, we offer at ESSEC. Again, this should be, uh, although we, we, we are taped, uh, this should be a, a little bit interactive, um, not too much, but a little bit. So if you have any question, feel, feel free to ask your questions. Uh, if, if you raise your hand and I don't see you because of the sun, uh, then, then just you know, raise your voice. Uh, that will be just fine with me. So international strategies, I decided to focus on the retail business. Uh, could have talked about international strategies for uh, other sorts of businesses that are more involved with the shipment of goods. Uh, and then we would have talked about issues of where to locate a value chain, where to locate a production facility, where to locate certain uh, support functions. Uh, but I decided to focus on the retail sector because the retail sector, number one, is is a big sector. Uh, and it's a sector that's fairly important for many, uh, many countries today. Uh, retail is something that you cannot outsource for the most part. Now, you can outsource the profit, or well, you can repatriate the profit. But, but the retail sector generally employs lots of people in their countries where they actually, where sales are being made, uh, although part of the value added is actually repatriated to the, uh, the, the, the country of origin, I would say. So I thought it was an interesting topic. The second, uh, second part of the, the reason why I chose the retail sector is you all know a bunch of retail companies. You know, for instance, uh, give me a few examples of retail businesses. What do you mean by retail? Retail means uh, the, uh, the actual place where the physical sale of products or products uh, is actually made. So if I take an example, for instance, a store, a store like Zara, like H&M, uh, uh, or a store like uh, um, uh, even grocery stores would be considered to some extent as, as being part of the retail sector. Uh, part of, for instance, um, if you think about luxury companies, take uh, Cartier, for instance, Cartier, you have part of their business is in the production, so, so they, they manufacture, they're manufacturers of uh, luxury products. But they also have some activities in the retail sector, their shops, where they actually sell their products. Uh, we can think of other retailers. Um, did, you did you have a, one of these wonderful sandwiches for lunch? <laughs> well, I, I wished it was Mark and Spencer, yes, thank you, but it wasn't. Uh, I, I'm not gonna say the name of the company involved with these sandwiches, but um, that's also part of the retail sector, if you want. Uh, the other uh, restaurants that are out there, the pommes de pain, etc., etc., are part of the retail sector. So everything that sells something, it's a retail sector? In the form of retailing, yes, yes. And you also have online retailers, although today, uh, I talked this, this morning, I had another masterclass on, on something that was more technology-driven uh, online. Uh, today, I want to concentrate on the offline. You know, we still have a bunch of things that, that, is, that is offline, but Amazon is a, is a retailer. Okay, so it's a big thing, the retail business. And I wanted to talk about it in the sense of the way they internationalize, their, uh, the, the, what, what strategies they, they uh, decide to follow when they internationalize their business. And I will raise a number of questions first. 
What we will do, we will be talking about a company. I like to use some cases, uh, case studies, if you want, to illustrate uh, some of the challenges companies have when they try to expand internationally uh, in the retail sector. So we, we will be looking at Starbucks. Now you all know Starbucks. Fairly easy uh, uh, products to understand. It's coffee for the most part, with a few other things that they sell. Uh, Starbucks also is interesting in a sense that they, they it's fairly standardized in the, in the way the, the shops and the retails uh, the, themselves are organized. If you go to a Starbucks shop uh, in the US, it will be pretty much the same than the one, uh, than the one you have, let's say, at the Gare de Lyon, uh, if you go there from time to time. It's essentially the same concept. Um, and so, so their concept brings uh, opportunities and brings challenges for companies like Starbucks. So we'll be talking about Starbucks. All right? My first question to you is, is the following. Now, it's coming. It will be coming. I'm not sure what I'm touching here. Let me see. Oh, it's coming. OK. You know that company? Yes. What is it? Apple. Apple. OK. Now, what Apple is doing, so they do a bunch of things, but part of it, they also have the Apple stores. So they also are somehow in the business of retailing. Not much, though, but. Uh, uh, that's probably not their largest channel, but they are also in a little bit in that segment. So Apple, okay. Don't worry. Here we go. This one. You know this one? Walmart. It's Walmart. They also sell stuff. They have big stores. Okay. Okay. Next one. This one. GM. Automobile, car manufacturer, General Motors. Okay. This one. Huh? Airline company. Airline company? Yeah. Well, it's, it's history, actually. Oh. Okay, no longer exists. Yeah, but. <laughs> yes, it used to be in the airline uh, business. It's, it's so, what my question here is what makes these companies different from, what? from one another? Well, yes, they, 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 they had different strategies, obviously. And if you look at the ones on, the, on, on that side here, Apple and Walmart, these two companies are still pretty successful today. I mean, just think about Apple. I mean, they're probably the most successful company at the moment and have been the most successful for, for several years. Walmart is still pretty successful. Now they had ups and downs. They had some problems in some countries where they could not actually penetrate the country the way they wanted. They had to, to do things a bit differently in other countries. Uh, but overall, it still is fairly successful. Now, on the other side, GM and Suisseur, what happened to them? GM had to go through bankruptcy protection. Uh, in big part from what, what has been said, to actually be able to renegotiate some of its employment, uh, uh, let's say, contracts, uh, mostly with unions, and to renegotiate some of these uh, pension uh, uh, issues that they had. Uh, but they had to go through bankruptcy protection. So clearly not the, the most successful outcome for a company. Now, even worse, and though I'm Swiss, so you see, I'm, I'm very honest here, it has gone through total bank bankruptcy. I remember there was a time, you know, Swiss pride, Swiss air. At one point, during what has been termed the grounding of the fleet, you had pilots from Swiss air landing in Buenos Aires, then having to refuel. And I think the airport in Buenos Aires saying, yes, if you want some fuel, you got to pay us cash. And it's not like when you go to you for your car, right? It's not the same check at the end. It's not like 50 euros. Uh, they had to pay cash, so, they, so if, they, if they didn't have the cash, then they wouldn't have be refueled, and thus they would have been they would be grounded. They could no longer fly, and th there was one day where the almost the entire fleet had been grounded for Swiss Air. For a few days, they actually you know had pilots carry bunch of of you know uh, uh, cash uh, in, in their bags uh, to fly. I mean now it was Swiss francs, so it's probably a good thing for for for, for the. The airports who had to, to provide the fuel, but they, they have been grounded. Okay. Why? Cash. No cash. Yeah, why uh, Buenos, Buenos Aires was just a, an, an, exotic, an exotic location I found just like, like, it could have been Paris. Could have been wherever. 
except Zurich and Geneva. But only for Swissair? Yes, because Swissair had followed a wrong strategy that put the company at risk from a cash flow or a liquidity standpoint. And so, and so, you know, a lot of people were no longer willing to simply say, you know, when, when someone comes to you and say, well, give me, give me some fuel and I'll promise I'll pay you when you send me the invoice. Uh, a few, few people started to question that, uh, you know, logic and say, well, we, we no longer trust you. And so these two companies have gone through some wrong, probably strategic moves uh, and to some extent was part of their internationalization or lack of internationalization. GM took serious hits during the financial crisis, um, especially as it started in the United States in 2007, when, when the entire automobile market went down significantly. Uh, and as a consequence, GM, which had, had still most of its sales taking place in that market, took the hit uh, big time, as opposed to other companies that were a little bit more diversified and had to uh, had more sales, let's say, from abroad and from, from other markets that were less severely uh, hit by the financial crisis in 2007. Uh, yet, so GM probably took a wrong approach to their, their, strate their strategy of, of, of development, which was probably not enough in internationalization to somehow diversify in various markets. While Swissair followed another strategy which at the time was called the hunter strategy. The hunter, you know, bam, sorry. Uh, nothing again against you, nothing. The hunter strategy was a grand strategy formalized by a consulting company, which I'm not going to, you know, not going to tell you who that company is. You can actually Google it and you'll find it. Uh, but essentially, it was a strategy where they thought that they had to grow big. They had to grow fast uh, to s continue to survive in, a, in, in an industry that was known for making almost no profit over time. If you want, so from a year, they would make a profit. The next year, they would make a loss. But over the cycle, they would not make a profit. So they thought they had to grow fast and big in size. So they went after that hunter strategy by acquiring a bunch of companies. Sabena, the Belgium carrier, uh, then, then Lot, the Polish carrier, etc., etc. So they started to acquire all of these companies. Now, when you acquire companies, you have different ways of going after that. Either you use your cash, your equity, uh, or you leverage, <laughs> you leverage your acquisitions. And, and Swissair leveraged a bit much their acquisitions, hence took on a lot of debt, which then created some liquidity problems. Uh, Swissair did a bunch of other things that were not necessarily too smart. But essentially, it took them to that grounding day. Uh, after that, the Swiss banks, they tried to help Swissair by providing some cash, but they asked for a, 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 a significant change in the management and so forth and so forth. That didn't work. And so today, Swissair is called Swiss and is owned by Lufthansa. Okay. Uh, and no longer flies the same routes that it used to fly. I remember the good old days. I could fly Geneva, New York every day. Today, I have to go through Frankfurt or Munich. Okay, so not the same. Uh, let's say, uh, not the same company. So the, the real question is, what, what happened here in there? So Swissair probably tried to internationalize or grow, develop too much. They stretched a bit much, stretched a bit much. So the reason, or let's say the, the problem here is, what make, makes these four companies very different, Apple, Walmart on one hand, Swissair and GM on the other hand, is their ability to, to on a sustainable basis, generate value or create value. So it's a value problem. You see, is, is it big enough? And I decided to color it in red. Because if you, if, you, if you don't, you know, red is the color of what? Blood. 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 Uh, and the reason is because the in inability of some companies to create value on a sustainable basis take them to their, to their end. It's not, a, it's not a matter of choice. It's a matter of system, economic system, which simply says that corporations or other economic entities today must, and it's not should, it's must, generate a return greater than the cost of capital that they employ or the capital that they invest. It's as simple as that. It's a basic principle. Now, 
So generating a profit is not necessarily sufficient if your profit is not enough to compensate for the cost of the capital you employ. And if you fail to do that for multiple periods, then obviously you are subject to bankruptcy or to being taken over by others, other than, as in the case of, of Swiss Air. So let's have a look what drives value before we get into to this notion. So economic value is driven by two things. One is cash flow related. So it's really about the cash, the ability to generate cash. So cash flow related, and the other one is cost of capital related. We're not going to get too much into cost of capital at all. Cash flow is driven by two things. It's driven by the ability to generate a return on invested capital, generate 10% return on the capital I invest, 15%, 20%, or 5%. Okay? The ability to generate a return. We'll, we'll look into the details of what's driving that in a minute. Second driver of value here that is cash flow related is growth, is revenue growth, is revenue growth. So you have these two elements. And obviously, if we think about it, revenue growth, Swiss Air had revenue growth, but they had a lack of return on invested capital. Okay, they were not able to, for every euro or Swiss franc of added revenue, they were not able to convert that into a uh, uh, free cash flow that would generate a return on invested capital. On the other hand, GM probably had relatively okay return on invested capital, but failed to, to generate sufficient revenue growth that would have diversified its value creation base. On the other hand, the two others, Apple, I mean, huge on, on return on capital, and it's probably pretty big on, on, on revenue growth. I mean, just looking at the latest iPhone sales, I mean, it seems that they're able to sustain double digit growth and have been able to sustain that for, for a long period of time. Walmart, pretty, pretty good at generating that return on invested capital due to their, their business model, uh, in essence. And they've been pretty good at maintaining their revenue growth. So as somehow kind of a proof, if you want, the ones that are still there are the ones that are able to work on both. And so the, that notion is critical when you think about development. And we will see that with Starbucks. Starbucks sometimes made the wrong decisions and sometimes made the right decisions in terms of their international strategies. So we'll look into that and how they affect these two drivers of return. Now, ca cost of capital standpoint, it's, it's the ability to uh, compensate investors for the risk they take and inflation, uh, two, two elements. That, unfortunately, although risk, you could, you could d discuss the ability of management to change their risk profile, uh, but that is rarely under the control, full control of the management. What's under the control of the management is the two drivers up there, which are somehow the, the, you know, very much related to their strategic choices. Looking into some details here. So if we look at return on invested capital, two things drive that return on invested capital. One of them is the ability to generate a margin from operations. Your revenues, let me put it very simply, sales minus operating expenses. Okay. Uh, and then you generate an EBITDA margin. So either you cut costs or you increase your price. You have different ways of looking into it. And the second one is capital turnover. The ability to sell more with fewer capital stuck into something. Good example here would be uh, you know, the low-cost airline companies. They use the same aircraft as others, except they fly them more frequently per day extended hours. So they rotate their capital in investment more frequently. One way to think about it. EBITDA margin is about operational efficiency. Capital turnover is about asset management efficiency. And, and these two things also will have a key role in the strategies for international development in the retail sector. So this generally is a must. Companies who don't do that fail. Swiss Air. <laughs> Uh, it's a must, but it has limits. Give you an example of some companies that take a Subway restaurant. You know Subway restaurants? What do they sell? Sandwiches. Okay, they, they don't sell metro tickets. Huh? They sell sandwiches. They sell Subway sandwiches. Yes. Now, so d do you know how many, how many of their stores, how many of them do they own? Like they, it's their stores. I think there's one, but even that is unsure because they, they're hiding it to test things. All the rest is what? Franchised. 
It's a franchise, so they don't have any penny of capital invested there. Now, so if they wanted to decrease the amount of capital invested, I mean, at one point, you cannot go negative, right? So there are limits, constraints. Same thing for EBITDA margin. You can outsource HR to Poland. You can outsource IT to India. You can try to cut all of these costs. But at one point, there's no more to cut. So it's a must, but it has limits. Something that needs to be cared for, cared about. Second part is the revenue growth. Two elements, market share. So competition for more market share in established existing markets or new market development. Uh, if you can think of something else, you tell me, OK? Because you know, I would add them uh, my, on my slides. Second uh, driver is price premium. So you can drive revenue growth, although price premium can also be related to EBITDA margin, because you, you generate more, more, more revenue per quantity that you sell. But these are two elements that would drive also revenue growth. These two are related to business development, the first one. Second one, branding, innovation, value, any kind of value-added services. Uh, and again, related to some kind of, of, of strategies. Opportunities and risks in, in any kind of environment. In the case of Starbucks, to maintain their price premium, yet increase market share, has been a challenge for them domestically in the United States. When I, when I was living in Houston, Texas. Okay, have you ever been there? It's a very nice city. Midtown is the place to be. Uh, so I was in Midtown, and I remember driving on that street, which I can, which probably called Main Street or something like this. And if not, you know, there is a Main Street anyway. Uh, and I remember that I could see regularly on that street. It's a long street. So, so, you know, Houston has been built on, except the downtown area, most of the, most of the, 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 the buildings are two stories or three stories buildings. So you need, you know, you have five million inhabitants, so you need a lot of signs. So it's big. So you drive a lot. And so I was driving on that street, and I could see regularly one Starbucks on one side of the road and another Starbucks on the other side of the road. But the market was there. So they, they grew their market share to a point where they were present in every location in the United States. Uh, the problem is that what they lost is their ability to charge a price premium. So they started to have price pressure coming from that. Not because they, there was not sufficient market size, but simply because their product became almost commoditized. People had enough of Starbucks. There were too many stores everywhere. Um, that's an example. So the inability to maintain that due to the market share. So there are trade-offs to make. When you think about strategies, you always have to make trade-offs. You cannot do everything. Now, international strategies, you have various ways of looking into it, various dimensions. The, the approach to market participation. On what basis do you decide to participate in a certain market? First one is opportunistic. You can opportunistically go in a market simply because, hey, I see there's a chance for me to open something in that market, opportunistically taking, taking the market. Or the other uh, decision at the other extreme is, I will enter a new market if and only if I can have a significant share of that market, i.e. a dominant position. And anything in between can exist, by the way, but generally the trade-off needs to be made based upon which one you think is the most appropriate. Product offering. You can decide to standardize globally your product offering, the same everywhere, or you can try to adapt locally. Now, the consequences are very different, as you can imagine. Okay? If you need to adapt locally, the problem is you need more R&D per new product developed. If you standardize globally, you have one R&D function that's developing your product for the world, and you cannot adapt locally. So you have various consequences in terms of cost. Uh, and you have different also consequences in terms of uh, the way you can, you can sell in, in these markets. Uh, so different options. Another one is location of the value chain. You can decide to have a location, your value chain. So just to let you know, value chain are all of the, all of the activities that companies are controlling internally. That's their internal value chain. It can be from sourcing, so purchasing, to, um, uh, let's say, production, sales, after-sales service, marketing, all of these are activities in the value chain. You can decide to fully localize your value chain, or you can decide to actually locate your value chain in countries that are either more specialized in this or simply cheaper 
uh, in terms of, of costs. Two different other axes here. You can have different marketing focus as well, uniform worldwide or local, which is a bit similar to the product offering in a way. Uh, and competitive moves, you can decide to actually have, have make strategic moves either on a global scale and to integrate all of your strategies, or you can decide to fully localize these kinds of things by country, on a country by country level. These are the kind of two extremes you can have. And obviously, companies need to make trade-offs in their decisions. So they either go one way or another. Um, another way to look into strategic choices, options, these are fairly generic options. You can think about it in terms of market or products. So keep in mind the, the notion of driving value, two things. I'm testing you now. Just checking if you pay attention. I'm not going to point at anyone, but I, I may. I may point at you, so please answer if you know. What are the two drivers of value creation? Revenue growth. And return on invested capital. OK. OK, very good. Now, if your goal is to add more value, create more value, because you don't want to end up like Swissair, you need to you know, try to push on, on these two drivers of growth or engines of growth. You can do it in different ways. You can either do it, let's say, if you, have, you take products, you have existing products, and you can either try to further penetrate your market to grow. In doing that, you probably can consolidate some of your costs and gains from scale, and thus also increase your return on invested capital. But further penetrating existing markets generally also has a consequence of having more competition to face, and thus potentially an impact on your ability to charge your price premium. Then, with your existing products, you can decide to go after new markets. That's the internationalization in a way. And in these new markets, you probably are going to grow your sales, your revenues. But depending on how you go after these new markets, you may see more costs. Because in these new markets, you will have less scale. And thus, you will benefit less from economies of scale. So you may see your return on invested capital decrease. Okay. Or then you can decide to diversify in a way by launching new products, either in existing markets, not very easy. And we see today, in today's world, you have fewer and fewer companies that are involved in multiple sectors. Wh what we've seen is a tendency for companies to concentrate on their core business, okay, to, to focus. So it seems to be complicated. Or what you can try to do is to diversify. Diversify both product and market. Again, that seems to be fairly complicated. To give you an example, Starbucks, at one point, because we're going to talk about that, decided to, to try to sell coffee, ma coffee machines. And they stopped. And then they tried again. And they stopped. And they tried to sell them in their existing stores. But then they stopped. And then they started to sell them in uh, Walmart or, or other retailers. And then they stopped. Then they started to try to sell uh, coffee beans. They continued. And then they stopped. So it, it seems to be very complicated to actually get into, into other, uh, other products. So these are the options. Keep, keep, these, keep these options in mind. Then another thing that you need to consider when you think about international strategies is where are you yourself over the life cycle? And by the way, life cycle, you can apply that to anything, to yourself. Okay. So I would, I would think you're probably in the shake-up phase if you're here. No? With yourself. Unsure about what? No? Okay. I hope you're not in the decline phase, though because there's not much we can do then. Uh, but anyway, so you can apply that to markets, products, or product and markets. And you need to consider this. At the growth stage of a market, the market is what we call munificent. In other words, there is ample capacity to sell more products. It's a new market. There is not anything that is offered that is really competitive. The demand is bigger than the supply, if you want. Easy to enter, low rivalry, low competition. So there, you could certainly go for market, market uh, further market penetration. Okay, Starbucks in their domestic markets for re selling coffee in coffee shops, at one point in the 80s, were in that stage. Then, in the 90s, started the shake-up phase, where supply growth 
started to be fast, to grow faster than demand growth. And in that shakeup phase, what you see is, is bigger rivalry and a tendency to consolidate. So the small ones disappear and the bigger ones start to acquire smaller ones. Bigger rivalry, some kind of a dominant model emerged, i.e. the Starbucks-like emerged. And then the, the attempt typically is to either, if you want to stay in that market, to actually develop new product, what Starbucks did. And then at maturity, beginning of the decline, where demand growth actually s stops almost or is at near inflation level, uh, then what happens is diversification tends to, be, uh, tends to be the solution. Or international expansion. And this is exactly where Starbucks ended up. Okay? So thinking about this in terms of value creation. Coffee time? All right. This is Starbucks internationalization timeline, just to give you a few, a few uh, snapshots here. So it started really in, the, in, the, in 96. Where they expanded Japan, Singapore, Philippines, Taiwan, Thailand, England. And then you see the pace. I mean, it started really with some markets, but then the number of markets they added, new markets they added, increased significantly, if you think about it. Uh, look at how many markets they opened in new markets they opened between the end of 2007 and, and and 2000, beginning of 2008, in a few months. New markets for them entered new markets. So they expanded significantly. And in that history, in that timeline, they made good choices, and they made some other choices that were not necessarily as good. Let's have a look what we can learn from it. From a revenue uh, and, and store, sales store growth side, what we can see here, so you have, let me read for you, you have the uh, lighter gray, but uh, full uh, color, okay, the, the one here, the bars, uh, it's about foreign sales, so sales outside from outside the United States, which you can see was almost non-existent, uh, where is it, the, uh, here, and, and started to become the only engine of growth for Starbucks. So at one point, their growth, more than 100% of their sales growth came from foreign sales growth, as opposed to domestic sales growth. Second one, the dark one, is domestic sales, which still is the, the biggest component. But as you can see, the growth rate slowed down here. You see that life cycle. Uh, it slowed down to decline at one point. And overall, the, this, uh, the top one is total sales. What you can see here in the lines are the number of stores, foreign stores, domestic stores, and total stores. So here, they started to slow down significantly in their domestic market. And they tried to, uh, let's say, compensate the lack of domestic growth with international growth. But think about it. If you are responsible for that company, let's, let's assume your name is Howard Schultz for a minute. Now, I know for some of you it's harder than for others, especially, <coughs> especially the ladies. But if you think about it, you're there and you're contemplating your company that has been a success, major success stories. Yet you receive phone calls from your key shareholders saying, hey, you've offered us 20% return. Why, why do you expect us to expect more in the future? What makes you think we will accept less in the future since you, you gave us 20%? Your company is currently valued based upon the fact that you generated 20%. So we have no choice. Continue. And the guy is in, the, uh, is in his office, so put yourself in his shoes. It's 42, the size. Uh, so he's there and he's uh, thinking and, and saying, okay, I need to add value. Revenue growth or return on invested capital. What do I do? Domestic market seems to be a tough cookie to continue to expand. The coffee makers apparently didn't work as new product launch. What should he do? Starbucks phones? I don't know. It probably would be a stretch. So the only kind of Alternative is foreign ex expansion, no? Okay. Which is why what they did. Now, if you look at it, let me skip that one and, and that one. If you look at it, I, I'm looking at the time, so sorry for this. I'll come back probably. What Starbucks did, they expanded like crazy internationally due to the pressure of maintaining their value creation, OK? The problem is they started, you have three choices. No, I need to go back to my slide and see, I prepare, so that's, I should, I should remember that I prepared my slides. They had really three things to somehow decide. 
At what pace do we grow internationally? What pace? What, what you need to understand by pace is this. Oops. I apologize. If you think about pace, you need to think about it at, do you want a steep pace, so go very fast, or do you want a slower pace? Pace is the number of new stores you get open per day. Let's put it this way. On average, on average. So it's an average, that's why you have a straight line. Rhythm, which is the second somehow choice, rhythm, is what kind of rhythm, at what kind of rhythm do you want to open that, these new stores? Do you want a rhythm that is a very steady rhythm? I.e., like, like this, this is steady rhythm. Okay? You see it's steady. One, 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 one. Or you want a hectic rhythm. In other words, more opportunistic rhythm, which would be nothing, boom, a lot, then no, no, no. Okay, that would be hectic. I, I, I'm not too good at drawing hectic <laughs> things. But third thing that they had to think about was the, the scope. Do I want to do these things with a narrow scope of markets? Only a few markets that I want to dominate before I get to a new one? Or do I want to go with many markets at the same time? A wide scope. How do I need to think about it? Now, these are choices that need to be made when you think about internationalization strategy. So obviously, you would want to be at a fast pace because you need growth. But if you go at a fast pace, can you achieve it at a steady rhythm? Not necessarily, not that easy. If you want a steady rhythm that you can control more easily, then you probably slow down your pace. If you want to increase your pace, you probably need to actually go after more opportunistic choices. But then you have more hectic, which makes it harder for you to control and manage. So the hectic, the notion of hectic rhythm probably penalizes your EBITDA margin and potentially your return on invested capital, but you may gain from a stronger pace. Now, if you do that, the question is, if you want to increase the pace, revenue growth, then you probably want to go after every market with a wide scope. But if you go with a wide scope, you probably will also have a lower return on invested capital and a lower EBITDA margin because you will not be able to gain from scale. And thus, if you want to actually improve your EBITDA margin and return on invested capital, you would want to have a narrower scope. But then, tough to maintain the pace. You understand the challenge? That's why he's, he's, that's why he's being paid the big bucks. Because it's a tough, tough choice. So, they tested various things. And they realized that it was truly a tough, tough cookie here. So this here is, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult chart. I, I agree, but I'll tell you what you need to get out of it. It's the pace of Starbucks internationalization uh, in terms here, if you want, the percentage growth of subsidiaries. Pace, okay, the number that they opened. And this is connected with, with a log transformation, but for simple statistical reasons, connected with return on assets, which is an accounting-based measure of return on invested capital. It's not perfect, but it's better than nothing. So when you look at it, the greater the return on assets was achieved when they had the lowest pace. Remember the, when you were kids? Did you play with Duplo? Duplo. You played with Duplo. Could you get both sides up at the same time? No. Yeah. Okay. It's a bit like Duplo game. Okay. You seem, it seems that you cannot get both the return up at the same time than, the, than the, the pace. And the reason for that was probably because to achieve that pace, they had to actually, whenever they had a strong pace, they had to make it happen opportunistically, i.e. with a hectic rhythm. This shows the pace. And what you need to, and still linked to return on assets, greater return on assets were actually related to a lower or, or more steady rhythm, 
more steady rhythm, as opposed to, as opposed to a hectic rhythm, which was good for pace, but penalized their return. Thirdly, the scope. So you have on that axis here, you have return on assets still. And here you have that same kind of relationship, which is log transformed again, uh, with the number of countries that they opened, or markets, new markets that they opened, the scope. So the greater the scope, in a way, the lower the return on assets. It's when they have a narrow scope of growth that you can achieve that bigger return on assets. So the lesson here from that case is that you have these three things, pace, rhythm, and scope, and it's very difficult to find. There's no optimal solution. And companies in their internationalization, they have to think about these questions on a regular basis, but there's no optimal choice. But there's a question on the screen. What's wrong? Shouldn't say wrong, but what's incomplete? So think about it. You understand the three concepts. Pace, rhythm, and scope. You understand the notion of value creation driven by two things, return on invested capital and revenue growth. Problem is it seems that there is no good solution, in fact. No? And it's not true. It's not possible. No, it's true. There is no good solution. <laughs> there are better solutions, and there are ways to think about it. Think about it. Why is it that when you increase the pace, the rhythm or the scope. In fact, it's when you increase the pace through rhythm and scope that you have a decrease in return. Why is it in the case of Starbucks? In the case of Starbucks. And in the case of a lot of companies. It's a tough question. There is another framework that was uh, developed early in the 80s that has lost favor for a certain time, except in a few sectors, but not in all, which was called the OLI framework from Dunning in 81. Uh, o sta stand stands for ownership advantage, L stands for location advantage, and I for internationalization advantage. The various types of advantage companies seek to, to gain uh, and, and which drive the way they would enter into a certain market. And so what's missing, I think, in the case of the, think, the logic of the case of Starbucks is the notion of entry mode. Not necessarily only, so it's not only about pace, rhythm, and scope. It's also then a matter of how do you do that? Not just what you want to do, but how do you do it? And Dunning actually looked at it in terms of three types of entry modes. One of them being licensing, which is very similar to the, the franchising, uh, uh, let's say, uh, mode of operation that we talked about with Subway restaurants. You can license. You can export right, stuff for uh, Starbucks. Uh, or you can go through foreign direct investment, so full ownership like Starbucks did. Starbucks only considered this for indirect investment. Whenever they went into a country, in most cases there are a few exceptions they actually entered with their own subsidiaries, created subsidiaries. They were, they've, they've always been reluctant in franchising their brand because they thought that they had to, they had to have an international, inter, internalization advantage. The fact that they would keep that internally. They had to control their stores, to control the quality of their brand, to control something like this. That's probably their logic. But they could have thought, no, maybe we don't have that internal advantage of doing it ourselves. Maybe we can simply franchise or license. Coca-Cola is another example. Coca-Cola is known for what? Don't tell me beverage. Because yes, that's what they do. But they have more than Coca-Cola brands. They have more brands. I have a laser. No, they sell through vending machines, but they don't own any of this. Coca-Cola is known for being a very strong marketing company. It's a marketing firm. At one point, some people considered McDonald's only as a marketing firm. Do you think the anyone, anyone has a Coke or a Dasani or something that comes from them? Okay, this has not been produced, although you changed the liquid in it. 
the, or it's a new, it's a new type. But uh, this has not been bottled or produced by Coca-Cola. It's been bottled by someone that owns the license to actually be capable of doing it. It's probably written on it. You see, you need to read what's written in the back. And obviously, you scratch the whole thing, so. <laughs> I can't read. Uh, so, but they license because they don't think they have any internal adven advantage of producing and bottling that themselves. So to actually increase their scale without penalizing too much their uh, return on invested capital, they actually went through licensing, which means you don't put capital at stake. You license the right to do things for you in exchange for fees. Okay, it's a market entry mode. In fact, Dunning, it's a, old stuff, right? It's 30 something years ago, 34 years ago. Uh, so there has been some other uh, research that's been done to look into more of these entry modes. And in fact, you have various types or degrees of entry mode. You have licensing or franchising where there's almost no equity investments, i.e. no capital investments and thus low capital employed, high capital turnover, which enables you to grow fast yet maintain your your, your uh, value creation potential. Then you have others which are more on the service uh, agreements of service where you can control the, somehow the production or the, the, the bottling, but at the same time you don't do it with your own money. You only offer some kind of expert uh, uh, service so that you can still control, still have an internal advantage, but in exchange for fees without putting capital at stake. Then you can have joint ventures, which could be used as well, JVs, or you can go through the full subsidiary. And in fact, when we looked at this is a study we did on the hotel business, which is also in the retail business, uh, which has also expanded internationally. And when you think about the hotel, the capital employed to open one hotel is probably the equivalent, on average, to opening 100 Starbucks stores in terms of capital employed. So, so the, the question of, of putting that money at stake uh, is, is even bigger in that sector. And so what I did here is I compared the reaction investors had stock market reaction to announcements of entry modes made by various international hotel chains. And what you see here is when a company, so I separated that between two types of environment, environments that are were more emerging environment, where there's potentially more growth, but potentially more risk associated with the environment, which I looked at non-OECD countries, i.e. emerging countries, developing countries. And I contrasted that with those that were mature economies, mature countries that are part of the OECD. I know it's a bit of a rough uh, separation of the world, but you know, sometimes you don't have sufficient data to get into more details. And what I looked at is whenever the stock market, the, it's, it's, it's a matter of not how the stock market moved, but if there was an abnormal movement in the stock market, so a true reaction that was just due to that announcement and w what that abnormal uh, let's say, um, uh, abnormal return, whether it was a positive return or a negative return, uh, or, or let's say, a, a perception by the stock market. And I did that for three different types of internationalization strategies. One which went through franchise, licensing slash franchise. And what you can see, this is always well perceived by investors because there is no capital at stake. There's no capital at stake. So it will increase revenue growth, but it will not penalize return on invested capital. However, it seems that this is even better perceived in mature markets, where actually revenue growth generally occurs at the price of certain EBITDA margin consequences due to the fact that they are saturated market very often. Um, so franchising is even better in that case because you don't, you don't, you don't have to suffer from poor operating income. You just take fees. Then management agreements, where you take a bit more risk, but not with capital, but with your margin, your EBITDA margin, was very well perceived positively in developing economies. Because you could take more of the upside from that growth without putting your capital at risk. So another way to look at it. While it was negatively perceived in developed economies, because there, there was a third solution that was better perceived, which was basically equity involvement. Full subsidiary. Full subsidiary is much better perceived in developed markets than it is in emerging ones. All right. 
So, what are the takeaways? When you think about uh, international strategies, you have to think about whether you want to go after that from a more multi-domestic perspective or more from a global perspective. These are the first things we discussed. Do I want to go local or not? If you decide to go global, you will probably not be able to go very fast global. Or if you do, you will have to go fast, but with a narrow scope, because you cannot adapt locally too much. If you go, then the second element is market penetration and development and diversification. What is it that you need to do in that consequence, in that, in that, um, for that question? If you want to further penetrate a market, then you can probably do that more hectically, but you will not do that in terms of increasing the scope. If you develop new markets, you will increase the scope, but probably at the expense of pace. And finally, if you decide to diversify, then good luck, because then you will probably have to increase both uh, the scope and the hectic uh, dimension, the rhythm dimension, which will probably penalize your pace or return. Then, so the two, three other dimensions to think about, pace, rhythm, and scope. And finally, the entry mode that is selected. So these are the kind of takeaways in terms of international strategies for the retail sector. And there is no actual method. There is no actual method. There is no winning recipe. You know. There is no winning recipe. It's contextual and it's always a matter of actually being capable of of thinking about the, 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 the trade-offs that needs to be made. And there is probably at one point in time a better trade-off. But that better trade-off at one point in time might not be the be next better trade-off. It's contextual, as we've seen. Um, if we see at the previous slide, it's very contextual. And it's contextual not only in terms of the type of countries, but also in terms of the where they are in terms of their life cycle. So these are the takeaways. If you want to know more, more details, I've covered a number of topics, which could each be given an entire lecture. Uh, but if you want to know more, then you have to come to ESSEC <laughs> in one of our programs. If you have any questions, feel free. I'm here. Uh, and if not, well, thank you very much. Questions? I said you can ask them in French, German. Italian, and then I respond in, no? Well then, thank you very much, and I hope you have a nice day and a nice open day. Uh, and again, if you have some personal questions, I will be out uh, after this for, for some, some time, so let me know. Thank you, have a good day.